Today I want to look at how I plan to balance my seven groups of 18650s in my new 7S20P lithium iron pack. And it won't come as much surprise that I really like this capacity controller. I particularly like its low price and it seems to do a good job of balancing my cells, although it's not an official feature on the one I bought at least. But sadly this device isn't really optimised for these 50 amp hour packs uh, because it can only balance at a maximum of about 60 milliamps which uh, isn't going to do much with such a large group of cells. So I bought this ISDT BG8 S unit uh, which I thought looked really interesting and although the voltage readings seem to be very accurate the screen is a lot nicer than the capacity controller unfortunately it balances at a similar level about 60 to 70 milliamps in my tests and unfortunately you also have to manually start that process whereas the capacity controller once you've set it into balance mode it will continue to do that well forever. Now if my initial tests were accurate and this is exactly as I've tested it 2544 milliamp hours and the same goes for all the other cells in that pack well you would hope that these two are extremely well balanced. However repacker.com which I use to group these cells doesn't ask for internal resistance. So although these two packs have the same capacity they may not have the same internal resistance so one may self discharge a little bit more than the other and as a result there's still a good chance that active balancing will be required on a good day the solar panels on the roof of the shed should be able to charge these packs when they're in their 24 volt configuration at up to about 8 amps given good sun and a low battery bank. So I'm certainly going to need more than 60 milliamps of balancing current to keep a wayward pack in check. Now I did consider creating my own system which on the surface seems quite easy. All you need to do is uh, test the voltages of each of the separate cells here in this example 3S pack and if this one was the highest well we'll put a resistor across it and we'll discharge that a little bit and we'll leave that for a little while we'll remove it again and uh, test all the cells once more. Are they any more in balance than before. Accurately measuring the voltage is tricky however. Microcontrollers typically work on 5 volts so using an analog to digital converter you can easily measure the first cell which shouldn't go over 4.2 volts in this example. The trouble starts when you want to measure the second cell. The circuit ground is here so measuring the second cell at this point here would exceed the 5 volt maximum input of the Arduino in this example. With what might be up to 8.4 volts here, you'd soon fry the analog to digital converter. Some people have attempted to change the circuit ground as well as the cell positive using relays or MOSFETs or something like that, but this becomes quite complicated and cumbersome. So the idea is you measure this cell in the middle then you disconnect both the positive and the ground and then you measure the next cell in series. You could also look at a resistor network. This ensures that the measured voltages are within the limits of the microcontroller. So we'd uh, attach the first analog to digital converter here across the first cell. No need to protect this in this example. These uh, voltages here are well within uh, the safe limits. On the second one, well, we'd need to uh, reduce the voltage, don't we, from 8.4 to something a little bit lower so uh, we could put a voltage divider here on this second cell but as we increase the amount of cells we need to increase the amount of resistance as well to reduce the voltage so uh, now we'd be looking at putting ADC 3 over here um, in this particular voltage divider and of course this increases as we go along the cells. 
And the result is that all these additional resistors introduce inaccuracies, which uh, as we move along the cells, I guess will get worse and worse. It came to me that you could negate the high voltage issues by using a microcontroller for each cell, but we've still got a communication issue. But then what about if we used a wireless capable microcontroller, which would allow communication between each microcontroller without a grounding issue? And of course the uh, ESP8266 seemed like quite a good idea, and I bought a few of these with the idea of doing exactly that. Unfortunately, the ESP8266 uses quite a lot of power when it's not in sleep mode. And if this is constantly checking the voltage and uh, talking to all the other modules, well, it's difficult to put it into sleep mode. And the other little issue which put me off this idea was that the ESP8266 can only measure, I think it's 1.1 volts on its analog to digital converter. So unfortunately, it wasn't ideal. Plus then, I'd have to write a load of code. While I was umming and ahhing about what to do, I mentioned in my last video that Colin Hickey got in touch and mentioned this project here. And it's a DIY BMS by a gentleman called Stuart Pittaway. And straight away, I was drawn to this project for a number of reasons. Firstly, it seemed to be developed very quickly. Stuart Pittaway is obviously a clever chap. And on his GitHub repository here, there's lots of code, there's lots of documentation, and uh, there's also a, a nice readme here, and a full shopping list of uh, all the components you require. It also has Gerber files here for a PCB. There's also a PDF somewhere in here, there we go, of the uh, schematic of this project as well. Although sadly, this one is a little bit out of date. This is uh, referred to as version one and he's already onto version two. And in the absence of a version two schematic, well, I reverse engineered the PCB and got my paper and pencil out and made a few mistakes and started over. And here's what I've come up with. Firstly, on the very left hand side, we have a voltage divider here comprising of three resistors in this case because the AT Tiny is running at 3.3 volts and using an internal 2.5 volt uh, voltage reference, we can't connect the full 4.2 volts of the cell uh, to the analog to digital converter. So uh, the uh, voltage divider should give around 2.5 volts at this point uh, when there's 4.5 volts up here on the battery. So uh, that gives plenty of headroom uh, to measure the battery reasonably accurately. The uh, rest of the circuit here is protected by a diode for reverse polarity and this PTC which is rated at 1.5 amps. So that's the maximum this can discharge, 1.5 amps. The uh, REG 710NA voltage regulator is a 3.3 volt book boost regulator and this is one of the main improvements from version 1 which used a low dropout linear regulator which probably would have stopped working at something around 3.4 volts. The supporting capacitors here are exactly as shown in the typical application diagram on the datasheet for the REG710. Uh, this capacitor up here is for the charge pump, which is used to boost the voltage um, on the output of this book boost regulator when the input is lower than that 3.3 volts. Here we have a thermistor, which is a uh, 10K negative coefficient type and will be read by the AT Tiny uh, to keep an eye on temperature. The AT Tiny controls this uh, status LED down here and two IO pins up here which are used for the I2C communication with their respective pull-up resistors. Now, 
This uh, I squared C goes through the Adam 1250 ARZ um, isolation IC. So uh, everything on the left is isolated from everything on the right to uh, allow the communication between the different modules. Now this is probably the most expensive component on this whole board. Um, from a local distributor, this is nearly five pounds in the UK, but uh, as often is the case, AliExpress is your friend. Finally, right over here on the right hand side is the discharge circuit. So we've got a power resistor here and uh, the N channel MOSFET, which is obviously controlled by the AT Tiny. And there is a pull down resistor on the gate to ensure that that uh, MOSFET goes completely off. There's also an LED up here, which gets turned on by that same MOSFET. So when the uh, power resistor is in circuit and we're discharging the cells, the uh, LED also goes on. Now the only thing I haven't put on here is the ISP header for programming the AT Tiny 85 because basically I couldn't work out how to fit it in. So I've had some PCBs uh, printed in China for this project and uh, I'm quite pleased with the result. Actually I only ordered 10 and they sent 14 uh, which is excellent especially for the price that I paid. So I think this PCB is quite nicely designed. The uh, AT Tiny goes down here. That's the ISP header that um, I didn't put on my schematic. The Adam 1250 I2C isolator chip goes there and we've got an in and an out for the communication for the previous and the next module. Over here we've got that Reg 710 book boost regulator and that one there the m1 is the tiny little mosfet that somehow i'm going to have to solder in that position the main battery connection is here and uh, the main positive goes through that diode and through the ptc but actually is that diode on the silk screen the wrong way round and then we've obviously got the large discharge resistor here so yeah i think it's quite a nice design the only issue I have is actually on the back and it's from here where the uh, main fuse comes through to that point just there and if we take a look on the back it connects through to this point here through a via so this is our main current carrying path here and that's an awfully thin track clearly uh, over here where it's uh, been beefed up well that's what I'd like to see to be honest so uh, this perhaps is a little bit thin and uh, potentially won't carry the uh, 1.5 amps uh, that the PTC at least is rated for it does seem a little bit thin that one it seems to be customary for this project that every single video requires a 3D printed element and this one is no different and here it is and it's a holder for the PCB so it's got these pegs on which uh, happily line up with the ones in the PCB there and uh, I guess because this is just plastic I could just heat this and plastic weld this on uh, to make it fixed permanently. The design is such so that it uh, just clips over the uh, 18650s in its holder and will sit there quite nicely. I've also incorporated this honeycomb effect on the back to uh, allow a bit of air movement between the cells and uh, the PCB as well. Because remember, this will be getting a little bit warm with this discharge resistor when it's working and potentially when the cells are charging rapidly or discharging rapidly they might be getting warm as well and uh, you'll remember in that schematic there was a thermistor well that's right here in the middle of the PCB and uh, I guess I could mount it on top of the PCB and measure the temperature of that resistor but that's not all that interesting to me so um, I've decided to mount it on the bottom of the PCB and I've left this hole there so that the uh, thermistor can pop through this hole and sit in between a couple of cells here and hopefully get a reasonable temperature reading of uh, this particular pack so not only is this uh, looking at voltage and of course controlling the voltage it's also looking at temperature of the pack as well so uh, that's a really nice additional feature so that's the plan for the BMS for my 7S 20p lithium-ion 18650 battery bank 
and obviously a huge thank you to Stuart Pittaway for all the work he's put into this project. I hope when I put it together, well, I hope it works. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video. If you did, give me a thumbs up, subscribe down below, comment if you can, and I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.